it. Okay. Thank you all for coming. As Libby said, I'm Matthew C. Lang, and this is going to be an encyclophilic guide to the plummet machine. Volume 4. Scopedelic perspectives on the plummet machine. Now I understand some of us are familiar with the plummet machine. For those who aren't, I'd like to briefly review. We'll start with our traditional diagrams in different formats, different formulae, just to posit exactly where the plummet machine exists in our world. We see some of the sketches of where it may be. And as I'm flipping through, if you don't know already, you're probably noticing that the plummet machine is composed of seven distinct organs. Again, the interplay of these organs, their relationships, are the very structure of the plummet machine. Um, and I know some of us already know this, but just to catch everyone up to speed, I'd like to briefly review the seven organs of the plummet machine and their functions. Um, so we start with the first, plumbo. And then the whole machine, just one last look. And we're in our plumbo. The plumbo can be depicted in a traditional sense, or can sometimes take on slightly different forms. Um, to better articulate the functions of the plumb bob, who better than Wittgenstein, um, just a brief note. The world is all that is the case. The world is the totality of facts, not of things. The world is determined by the facts and by there being all the facts. For the totality of facts, determines what is the case, and also whatever is not the case. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. And just another example of the plumb bob. Our second organ is, of course, a kindergartner SAMHSA transformation. The relationship of humanity to lesser creatures, to other creatures. We'd be remiss to say that it's completely lesser creatures, for cultures have praised a kindergrade of Samsa. We need only turn to the ancient Egyptians and their notion of the Kepera. Uh, the Kepera signifies at the same time as scarab and he who becomes for the Heliopolitan and he who becomes. For the Heliopolitans, he represented the rising sun, which like the scarab, emerges from its own substance and is reborn of itself. Kepri was the god of the transformations which life, forever renewing itself, manifests. He is represented as a scarab-faced man or as a man whose head is surmounted by this insect. Sometimes he appears simply as a scarab. Again, so we, to read something as if the metamorphosis has a, a negative quality is not always correct. And that brings us to the executive order. Democracy, culture, civilization. This is the modern world, the architect and the builder. Some examples of the nature of the executive board. And again, we can see the executive board emerging all around us. I'd like to turn to the March 21st issue of New York Magazine. One example of the executive board. I'm not sure if we can all see it, this is perhaps good in the light. There we are. Executive, the executive board at play. And then we have the cover story. Is prostitution just another job? Criminals, victims, or freelancers. What was once considered a gang of desperados, the next organ we see is now the executive board. Which brings us to a gang of desperados.
Something like the executive board, but chaotic, instinctual, running amok, running free, running wild. The first living thing on earth, as I might say. Another example of the executive board. I've spent a good deal amount of time thinking about this, wondering about this. I wonder if anyone else who's familiar with the plumbing machine has any sort of ideas of what um, a gang of desperados might represent. Yeah, right actually, yeah. I've been reading uh, The Western Lands mm. recently by William Burroughs, mm -hmm. and I think there's a really relevant uh, paragraph that relates to uh, the gang of desperados. Please share. Yeah, I've got it highlighted right here, actually. <laughs> um, so, knowledge takes many forms and contexts. Cloistered ivy covered halls, serious youths, youths in academic garb. The typical is so often not where it's at, it's deliberately avoided like a cliche, that it becomes in time atypical, and by the inexorable logic of fashion, is once again where it's at. Knowledge can be as explosive as matter into energy, as deadly as the virus for which the only cure is death. Knowledge can bind men together in secret brotherhood, the knowledge of some unspeakable deed or right so foul that an outsider could not conceive of it. So the brothers are safe if they stay together and keep silence. I think that's a, a pretty good. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brandon. It's wonderful. <laughs> Brings us to the shadow of the atomic bomb. The technocratic force, the tireless servants in the sky, the power of technology, all pervasive, ruling over our world. Anybody else have any ideas of what the shadow of the atomic bomb might mean? I wonder if you might reach underneath your chair, just on the underside of the chair. Bomb site. <laughs> Again, the shadow of the atomic bomb in some of its forms. Sidekick. Not to be lesser, not to be second to anybody, but to be the support, to be the one who backs everything up, the one who is there as assistance. I wonder, AJ, do you have any thoughts on the sidekick? Maybe you should teach him a new chair. There we are. <laughs> Ah, the classic. So you referring to the on the plummet machine. <laughs> <laughs> he is obliged to repeat the repressed material as a contemporary experience instead of, as the physician would prefer, to see, remembering it as something belonging to the past. These reproductions, which emerge with such unwished for exactitude, always have as their subject some portion of infantile sexual life of the Oedipus complex, that is, and its derivatives, and they are invariable, invariably acted out in the sphere of the transference of the patient's relation to the physician. A nice summary of the sidekick, which brings us to the sheriff. The despot, the ruler, Damocles asserting his force. Thoughts on the sheriff? Zach, any ideas? <laughs> Going straight for it? <laughs> no, no ideas. No, no, no. no, I have no idea. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> hmm. Who's that take? <laughs> Oh, 
sports. The dynamics between the lead, the lead vocalists always asserting their authority, the guitarist for whom the name is Dan, for who the band is made, excuse me, and of course the song that refers to the ultimate sheriff, the teacher, right? You see this interplay of different sheriffs, it's not always just one, it can be many sheriffs. us about the sheriff pretty well. Okay, and there we have the entirety of the plummet machine. We should switch back on this one too. Okay, now in, in the abstract, that's all lovely, but let's take a look at some of the examples in which the plummet machine is at work in our world, particularly today. Here we have the West Texas Ranch, where Justice Antonin Scalia met his death. As we all do, the plumb bog. And we'll move quickly through this example, just because I think we're all pretty, if we're paying attention to what's going on in the world, we should have some sense of the relationships at work here. The executive board, a gang of desperados run amok. The shadow of the atomic bomb, one of many examples of the sort of the global crises that are affecting us. This is, of course, a, a street in Syria which has prompted a refugee crisis. This is only one sort of small example of what of the worries that this office faces. A former sidekick now shifting power, completely <laughs> possible. It doesn't mean that somebody's relegated to that role. Somebody should always um, be able to. These are not fixed static. Entities, it's possible to move to and from. And of course, everybody vying to be the sheriff. Another example that we see of the plumbing machine at work um, is in Fort McMurray, Alberta. Right? We know there's a wildfire that's been ravaging the countryside. A natural disaster like the plumb bob. Um, our machines made to look like a kindergarten SAMHSA, giving us inse locust insect-like abilities. Um, the executive board stands back and watches. A gang of desperados forced to flee their homes, suddenly made, having no idea, no willingness to become a gang of desperados, now pushed out, become exactly that. The tar sands nearby, the shadow of the atomic bomb, oil mining. Jim Carr, the Natural Resources Minister, assuring all of the industry, uh, oil industry uh, executives that things will be okay, that oil will be back in production shortly. And of course, Justin Trudeau <laughs> taking his roles, taking the lead, saying that he doesn't need help from the outside governments. Now, this is a great example of the plummet machine at work today, but we'd again be missing the full entirety of the machine if we were to stop here. Because the situation, as we should imagine, can become much more complex. So if we take it back a couple of steps, we realize of Fort McMurray and the surrounding areas is composed largely of bitumen, the largest deposits in the world, in fact, um, a petroleum-based viscous material. This bitumen is actually the first material that was used to make photographic prints. Amongst other chemicals, Nisiphore and Epps combined the bitumen um, into, coated a metal plate with it, um, salted it, and made the very first photograph. Incidentally, Nieps was a man of many talents, a great inventor. He also inv invented one of the first truly functional steam engines, right? A technology that would make Edward Harriman a great deal of money. He became with this, this wealthy industrialist who set out on, on explorations. He gathered teams and set out across the United States. Um, particularly in 1899, he amassed a team of 30 who went from New York up to Alaska. On this trip was Edward S. Curtis, the famous photographer, sort of using several of Neves' technologies. Um, this is a, um, one of his photos from that ex expedition of the Molac or Pigeon tribe. Um, the pigeon people of the 
Blackfoot, uh, the Blackfoot Nation, one of their member groups, um, we see our, our member pictured here, right back in Alberta. Some 20 years later, uh, then a lieutenant colonel, Dwight Eisenhower made a similar trip across the United States. Um, his was with the military, the first transnational convoy, the first group to go across and examine the situation with roads, attempting to determine what we would need for our streets. Between then and his rise to the presidency, um, during, during the Depression, when we know of all these great public works, Eisenhower um, found a position at the American uh, Battle Monument Corps. They looked after all of the monuments. They maintained these. They sort of, they were put to work in the same public service until the war broke out. And of course, after that, we know Eisenhower would go on to become the president. Um, what we may not know is that in 1956, he established the, the, the Interstate Highway and Defense Bill, which made our our national highways a possibility. Funding was inevitable based on public opinion when the project started. So by one, tying it in with defense, saying that this was necessary for our nation to defend itself, he was able to grant some funding. And then there was an ongoing promise that the cost that fuel taxes would supply the maintenance for these roads. <coughs> of course, in 19... The, through the 1970s, coming to a head in 1979, we faced several oil crises. This one from 1979 under the Carter administration. Amongst the crises, amongst the sort of the ongoing international affairs that were tied to this, um, Carter okayed, um, it, it is, uh, drawing a blank now, it's, uh, sorry, it happens sometimes. Um, Operation Cyclone, um, which sent the CIA out to arm the Mujahideen, the uh, Afghan, Afghanistan guerrilla fighters who were fighting against the ascendant powers. You may know that there's all this, there's plenty of speculation, conspiracy theories about the fact that Osama bin Laden had direct ties, that George H.W. Bush was connected at the time. Some of it is speculative, some of it is traced. Um, in either case, the Carter administration and our government for fueling these groups to protect our oil. Another situation that we know would come to a head as these groups ascended in power more so than we ever expected, um, they established regimes. Of course, Hussein was not directly tied with that group, but we see a wave of regimes that are established, which once again in, the 19, in 1991, we were forced to go in. We weren't forced, we very actively went in and, and fought against this, um, this regime as he invaded Kuwait, right? Presumably over the oil situation. And as the Iraqi troops left, some of us may remember that they set fire to the oil fields, right? Burning up to 700 wells on their way out to ensure that the low prices that Kuwait was selling oil for would diminish. That they wouldn't be able to offer that oil again once the US um, was out, that it would maintain a higher price and that Iraq would benefit from that. <laughs> and then, of course, the then Defense Secretary, who would go on to become the CEO of Halliburton for five years, before we all know becoming the, the most uh, despised sidekick of all time, perhaps, um, is, is beginning to operate, working on a trend that was going to carry him through the early 2000s. What we forget is that in 2005, Dick Cheney was one of the lead sponsors of the Clean Energy Act. It all sounded great, and it did some very lovely things um, for, for our drinking water and for, um, for emissions. However, there were certain exemptions to this law, notably for Halliburton to continue fracking, where companies fracking would have, to, would have no obligation whatsoever to follow um, clean drinking water laws, right? So Halliburton is then acting carte blanche. Um, in addition to the fracking, it fuels projects such as the Keystone Pipeline. Now about two-thirds of the proposed, um, proposed way finished. Of course, Obama recently um, nixed the, the final third. But we're still pumping 1.1 million gallons of oil from this pipeline, as you can imagine, from Alberta through the rest of the country. 
And in May of 2014, um, Russ Gerling, the CEO of uh, Power Canada, comes onto the um, comes onto the air and says that this is going to create 42,000 new jobs. Eventually, he concedes that the number is going to be more like 50, but he assures us that <laughs> he assures us that we are installing clean energy to to deliver safe, uh, affordable fuel. But once again we see that that's not necessarily the case. Another example of the plummet machine at work, perhaps at its worst. Moving along, it's not all doom and gloom. We can look at something like the box office numbers from last weekend. <laughs> we'll take the top seven movies. This is out of order, but just to sort of replace them in the plummet machine order. Of course, the Jungle Book. This idolized view of nature. Keanu, people becoming animals, animals speaking to people. Zootopia, animals thrown into the modern world as if it's this beautiful, utopic place, grafting our democratic principles upon them. Barbershop, where the rules of, of the executive board are thrown out the window. Captain America, of course the shadow of the atomic bomb. The Huntsman, a curious phenomenon, a movie that seems to be comprised of nothing but sidekicks, the famous story lacking the principal character. <laughs> and of course, in honor of the sheriff that we all have had and known. <laughs> so there we have a few examples of the plummet machine at work. Let's return to the guise in which we look at the plumbing machine today. As stated, this is an encyclophilic guide to the plumbing machine, a piece of an ongoing project dealing with encyclophilia. Um, the idea of the general, cyclical, periodic, um, friendship, affinity, loving. We think of an encyclopedia as essentially trying to um, graft the, the notion of the general, of the knowledge, onto the youth, to teach, to train. Um, we come to a certain point in our lives where perhaps that becomes a bit less relevant. Perhaps not, but we start to wonder if, when it's not forced on us, we should think about the encyclos in a different way, as perhaps encyclophilia. And with that, we find that it doesn't necessarily have to follow the standard classification rules that we see. Here's some examples of the encyclopedia pages wrenched from their context so that we may look more precisely at the meaning, that we can take them out of the alphabetical scheme, which makes no sense in terms of how the world operates, and start thinking about things like a gang of desperados and its presence within the general knowledge. The shadow of the atomic bomb, less the actual sort of impact or radiation, but the general notion of spectacle that emerges through the 20th century. A sidekick at work. And the sheriff. <laughs> Another encyclophilic uh, investigation, looking at um, simply imagery. What if we sort of, what if we allow our vision to completely guide our understanding? What if we remove the alphabetical precepts and allow the visual relationships to emerge in different ways? We see new relationships emerging that were perhaps wiped away in extensive volumes organized by nothing but an alphabetical system. And the sheriff, if there ever was one, With that, I'd like to present a related idea, and that is of Scopadelia. Um, it brings, you know, brings a certain resonance to psychedelia. Of course, I don't mean it in a sort of um, you know, drug-induced state, um, but this idea of scope, scopic, to look, to see, to use your vision, um, and to for the Delos 
for things to become visible or manifest. What becomes visible as you look upon the world? What are the things that, by exercising a visual apparatus rather than an informative apparatus, will reveal themselves? Note that scope is also the, the root of skepticism, right? It's also the sort of the origin from which certain ideas, a few examples of looking, of seeing, of those who have expanded their own scopos to see the world afresh. A few more examples of scopodelia enacted in different spaces. I'd like to take a look more closely at the ways in which scopodelia may be imparted on the organs, or enacted, should I say, by the organs of the plumbing machine.
Okay, so that's one example of how the organs of the plummet machine might find themselves in at work. I'll turn it down just a little bit for a second. Here we are. Okay, so now we see the organs of the plummet machine fully functioning. We see that these organs can take their place. Oops, we gotta let's get our mic back on for one second. We see the place that each organ takes in the general scheme of the plummet machine. However, the relationships and the effects created by the relationships between the organs of the plummet machine become a much richer field for study. Just again, another example of the scope of that view of the plumbing machine. And again, go back to the slides for a second. For example, as we see here, the plumbing machine produces gyroscopic effects. You can see that that doesn't limit itself, but can play itself out in all different scenarios. Understanding of the microscopic effects. The plumbing machine produces stereoscopic effects. Perhaps most notably, the plumbing machine produces kaleidoscopic effects. Thank 
conclusion, we see the machine assembled, dismantled, and drafting. The possibilities are seemingly endless. In only a few minutes, we've already seen some of the ways in which we can alter the visual devices in our own sense of self through our vision to see the plumbing machine in the world around us. Thank you. Just so everyone can get out. <laughs> Any questions? It's, you know, there's, it, it is possible to sort of commit odious acts through the plumbing machine. Um, it is not something that is inherently there. It's not a force of, of nature, per se, though it does account for some of that. Um, I would say that it happens, and people inadvertently do that. So we can't, we can't fault those who commit odious acts via the plummet machine, um, because on the other hand, they may be committing very good acts in a different manifestation of the plummet machine. Um, what I would suggest is that we use the machine to um, make sense of those acts, that we use the sort of, that we can understand them and then uh, work accordingly if we are knowledgeable in its workings. <laughs> Has there been any investigation into the olfactory scopic capacities of the plumbing machine? <laughs> There's been very little, um, uh, much, much less than, than in the uh, scopodelic, but the uh, olfadelic is perhaps another field. And you, you probably notice you, we have a little bit less yeah. than those in the back, but um, <laughs> depending on the devices that are at play at the plumbing machine at any given time, um, there are sometimes. Uh, uh, there, there's a certain uh, quality to to the olfactory sensation that comes along with it. It's a great, it's an, uh, certainly another point for investigation. <laughs> yes. On a on a cursory level, it seems that the executive board exerts undue influence on the system as a whole. Is that illusory or is that real? Um, I. Depending on um, where, when and where you're examining the machine, um, it's strange to, I, I, I actually think that it's one of the, the organs that is, um, sort of slips into the background and kind of operates in tandem with a gang of desperados very often, or sort of fluctuates between the two very quickly. Um, so maybe if it felt like it's getting undue sort of presence, then, then that was just a matter of presentation. Did, you, did it seem like there was an, an, an unfair emphasis placed on the executive board? <laughs> no, not board? the presentation and the manifestation. Oh, okay. Right. Well, you know, we might look at a sort of, it's inherent to the situation where, you know, the sort of the, the lone wanderer in a field can very easily become the sheriff of his or her surroundings, whereas in a room we have, uh, we're, we're sort of subjected to become a room like this, we, what can we be but a, a gang of desperados or the executive board? Guess we all have a clear understanding now. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there are no further questions, then thank you very much. <laughs>
are we getting drinks?